panel is going to discuss internal migration and evolving policy frameworks for governance. Uh, we have on the panel today, Honorable Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, Manoj Jha, uh, IA Kundan, Principal Secretary, Women and Child Development Department, Government of Maharashtra, Amrita Datta, Department of Liberal Arts, uh, IIT Hyderabad, and uh, Rajiv Khandelwar, Executive Director, Ajivika Bureau. Uh, the session will be moderated by Mukta Nayak, Fellow Initiative on Cities, Economy and Society, CPR. Over to you, Mukta. Thank you, Priya. Um, I'd like my panelists to join in place of the Principal Secretary today. We have joining uh, Dr. Raju Jodhkar, Raju Manohar Jodhkar from WCD Maharashtra. He's the technical expert taking care of the program that we would like uh, to introduce to the migration discussion today. So if you could have all my panelists here. Uh, I don't need to tell this audience why we need to discuss migration. We've all seen the images, thought about the problem, and today we are trying to see whether we are moving towards a consensus on a solution or where we stand. Um, CPR is also extremely proud to launch a new initiative on migration. Uh, you have brochures in front of you of an initiative called IMIC. Initiative for Migration Action and Knowledge Engagement, uh, which brings together three partners, CPR, along with India Migration Now, and LEAD at Kriya University. So as we get settled and as we sort of move into thinking about internal migration, uh, I'd like to call my collaborator, Varun Agarwal, to just take us through this top-level elevator pitch on why we are doing what we are doing, and we invite you all to join in in whatever capacity you can. Varun, over to you, and if you could have the PPT, please. OK. Thanks, Mukta, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot to CPR for this opportunity to uh, collaborate and, and initiate IMAKE, Initiative for Migration, Action, Knowledge, and Engagement. I'll take just a few moments of your time just to give you like a high level sense of why are we doing this, uh, what's, the, what's the current scenario, policy scenario, which we'll discuss in this panel in details uh, that we're trying to sort of plug into, and then just talk a bit about what kind of outputs and, and uh, long-term targets we're trying to achieve. So just quickly, I mean, the story basically is that one year hence, one year from March 2020, when the sort of the crisis where this fulcrum has started, um, we had a lot of relief initiatives by civil society, by state governments, central governments to address the issues faced by uh, low-income migrant workers and, and their households. And so we were kind of one year hence. We were still in the middle of a very bad COVID situation, but the thought was moving into now more longer-term recovery, longer-term policy initiatives, and maybe even start looking at some much more structural sort of levers we can pull. And it was in this context we all sort of came together. but. The momentum that had been built uh, about the, this issue, and and how we can sort of take this forward. How can we take bring our capabilities of research, policy, and and action um, to sort of uh, support all the policy actors, whether state government, central government, local government, or CSOs, so that they can sort of really start in a very comprehensive way, uh, in a much more longer term way, addressing this issue. So that was kind of where the, was the genesis of the conversations which led to the creation of IMAKE. And um, so, like I said, you know, so just to, for those, just to refresh who have not been plugged into the migration space, you know, India has seen a rapid, and this is, by the way, outdated data because we don't have the 2021 census with us, but, uh, you know, we've seen a rapid increase in the total number of migrants, whether internal or external, from India. India's economy is highly dependent on migrants of different kinds. And, and, and so basically what we saw during the response, in, sort of during 2020 response and then 2021, what we were seeing was that we had a lot of research which was already in place, but didn't get the attention or the buy-in of policy makers, policy actors. And then we had a lot of policies, you know, which were sort of, and you know, we'll talk about the index that we run, which, which were already in place, which were not sort of uh, really sort of buying into the learnings and, and applying the learnings that the ecosystem, you know, many of them are sitting here uh, in this room today and, and applying them. So there was this disconnect 
that was very apparent in the response that we saw, especially in the first year. And, and so, and the two sort of prominent issues that came out was how do we measure migration, data, 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 that, that came out. And second was how do we effectively, whether relief or longer term services, how do we sort of service you know, migrants and their households properly? You know, migrants are highly mobile, um, they, they, they live increasingly clandestine lives. So how do, we, how do we service them? How do we effectively service them? Whether as a policymaker, as a CSO, or a private sector player, how do we, how do we service migrant houses? These, these issues really became like the, the key sort of uh, areas we wanted to address. So the, the, so the, the vision, and I'll, I'll articulate the whole vision which is in front of you, uh, but was, was that there's an ecosystem that exists clearly who are all interested and are plugging into it. It became very apparent during the crisis and the response to it. And so how can we support them? How can we sort of do some agenda setting? Um, at the same time, it was a realization that it's not a unidimensional issue. It's not just one department which needs to address migration. We don't need a dedicated, perhaps, central migration policy. What we need is a mainstreaming approach. And, and I'll show you a graphic in, in a second which, which sort of demonstrates this. But yeah, we need to mainstream this issue into multiple policies area, policy areas which, which matter for, uh, for effective response, long-term and short-term, uh, for migrant workers and their households, right? And so there was this systemic approach needed, and that's where mainstreaming comes into play, right? And we thought, key, okay, at the same time, we had the capability to do, do pilots and, and sort of really demonstrate some of the service delivery, effective service delivery measurement pieces. And this is where sort of this pragmatic innovation piece came to support policymakers. So this was kind of the broad sort of activities we wanted to uh, undertake, and, and the vision was very much that we need to mainstream the the, the, the concerns of migrants into our policy and development ecosystem. So that's kind of the mission that we are trying to undertake with IMAKE. Let me just bring you to now. Where are we today with the policy scenario as far as migration, internal migration in India is concerned? So I, I just told you about 2020, 2020 to 2021, we had a bunch of short-term release in, initiatives. We had skill mapping exercises. We had essential subsidies in place for food, grain, and travel. We had compensations uh, being sort of directed into accounts um, and, and social insurance schemes, right? So we had a sort of, you know, all these in immediate relief needs that were needed. Um, but then what we saw uh, from 2021 onwards was we saw some states, especially, you know, st the map in front of you highlights some of the states we've been engaging with. Um, through different ways, we're starting to sort of integrate uh, more longer term initiatives, you know, whether it was uh, drafting a migration policy for the whole state, whether it was labor departments coordinating with each other, whether it was education, you know, in different, different realms, we saw initiatives, longer term initiatives, more structural changes, one might even say, starting to take place at a state level. We also saw from central government uh, a push for PD PDS portability through ONORC, One Nation, One Russian Card. We saw in the budget that year, in 2021, uh, affordable rental housing complexes, you know, being incentivized. Uh, Ishram came with that migration mindset, and you know, so we, we saw all these initiatives, which were quite promising. It, 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 they gave us a baseline, a momentum to build upon, right? And we, and at the state government level, like I said, was where we saw most action, especially in source governments where the political incentive is strong. And and so one of the one of the goals we have going forward is to sort of build on this momentum, find the, the sort of the low-hanging fruit in terms of where we, you know, actors we can work with, provide them with technical support and, and all the sort of capabilities we have, bring that, make that available to them, understand what they need to, you know, scale these initiatives. And finally, like, we'll, we'll start with, with states, you know, like I said, where, you know, we find a lot of buy-in, a lot of momentum, and then see if we can sort of scale this to other states and, and have sort of national convening and more sort of broader mainstreaming, right? So just to demonstrate mainstreaming quickly. Uh, this is a graphic, an adaptation of something called the Interstate Migrant Policy Index. We have adapted this uh, under the IMIC initiative to also include uh, source states. So the original index, which was the first of its kind, Internal Migration Policy Index, looking at destination state policies. We also added a source dimension to address uh, the initiatives um, of source states and also to address the needs of left behind families and supported source. You know, and those sort of elements of, uh, of what migrant households, you know, require. And, and so mainstreaming is, we have all these policy areas, which is sort of, you know, are, are important when you're trying to do, create comprehensive support 
for a migrant household. This is through a lot of research, a lot of literature review, a lot of field work. We sort of settled on these sort of uh, policy areas. And, and the mainstreaming is to, instead of having a dedicated migration policy, maybe you need a strategy, which is what we've seen with the central government. But what you, what you, what you need is, is plugging into different, different policy actors, which, which are relevant you know, so from labor market to political inclusion to identity to housing. So this is what I mean by mainstreaming is that you want to build a reflex in each of these uh, departments, each of these actors within each of these dimensions, um, and, and, and sort of build a reflex to sort of respond to the needs. Ad but first, identify migrants as important beneficiaries, important recipients of what they're doing, and, and also then build a reflex to and the capability to respond effectively. Right? So IMAC is sort of trying to sort of provide the convening, the, 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 the technical support uh, to sort of achieve that. Uh, just finally to conclude, uh, like I said, so you know, what we will actually do, so we will um, bring knowledge generation, we'll do a lot of rigorous research, uh, compile our research, data sets, there's a lot of work we want to do on non-traditional data sets. Um, finally, action, which is where we really want to test solutions, do a lot of piloting, use the capability, especially you know, within IMN and Chero Network, uh, we share the brochures with you. We have a lot of capability to test things on the field. And, and, and we have sort of partners also who do the same. And, and these all become sort of demonstration of what works, what doesn't for the policy actors and other large actors we're trying to work with. And finally, engagement, continuous engagement, a lot of convenings and engagement, right? And, and this is where the three organizations which have come together. So with IMN, we have a sole migration focus and both research and, and, and action capability where CPR, of course, bring, brings unparalleled policy knowledge and network and lead brings incredible sort of evaluation and research ground sort of initiative um, capability. So we all come together to do these activities and, and sort, of, sort of, you know, help mainstream migration. So I'll, I'll pause there and uh, hand it back to Mukta and uh, good luck with the excellent panel. Thank you, Varun. I have no doubt it will be excellent because our panelists are going to actually demonstrate and speak to some of those promises that or propositions that Varun has laid out. Um, so, so we've seen that COVID has catalyzed this issue of response, policy response, migration, um, governance response to the issue of migration, uh, which is, you know, encompasses different levels of government, also employers, civil society. So it's, it's this very broad sort of response that we have right now. Um, so let me first start uh, with Professor Jha and sort of to, 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 to come to the heart of the question, has something fundamentally shifted? in the way policymakers are seeing migration? Does the issue finally have attention and traction? Or is it already on the way to being put on the back burner now that the quote-unquote crisis is over? Thank you. <clears throat> I never thought I'll be the first one. Mm. Uh, the reason being, uh, you know, I'm here as a representative of Parliament of India leave aside my political background. So failure or success, I'll have to own them. So I begin with an apology that we have not done enough. I mean, I'm not talking about the present government or the past government. As a body, as an entity, uh, we, we suddenly during the COVID realized, oh, oh, we have such migrant population. But the thing you knew, which you always knew, but somehow it appeared to you as it is shocking. Shocking was not them being on the roads. Shocking was the fact that we were in absolute denial. And this denial had its impact on policy, on intervention by the government, or I would say rather the governments, because government is in continuity, whether it is UPA or NDA or any other formation, the fact is, the governments are in continuity. Now, a uh, couple of things which I must underline. Uh, many of you came to know of me or about me as a parliamentarian after my COVID speech. Uh, you know, <clears throat> many opposition members also came. He said, I mean, they said, you actually pinpointed everything. Even the government was more than willing to address. But the fact of the matter is that we haven't done enough. I was uh, shocked to see when Varunji was presenting, my state does not figure out. 
in that list of states doing anything. Uh, I cannot blame it now. I have, we have our government in Bihar. So uh, on, from this dais, I can assure you that we are working on certain modules, which uh, we had promised during our election in 2020, that a center in those hub where migrants from Bihar are there, particularly Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, we were planning to have a Karpuri assistance center kind of thing. Let me uh, uh, work towards it in, in my own government. But primarily before I close the discussion uh, uh, from my side in the first go is, you know, when the COVID crisis occurred, we saw lots of things, disturbing images, but it was also a struggle between visibilization and invisibilization. It was a struggle between franchisement and disenfranchisement. It was a struggle to getting counted in, as well as pressure to get them count out. Or, and these visuals, I think if they have a parallel, uh, it matches partition visuals and much more brutal than the partition visuals. Because partition, partition visuals had li at least a sense six months before that people at this scale will migrate from one entity to newly created entity or vice versa. But in this case, it was so sudden. They had to negotiate at many levels. Different government structures, which were actually not very positive, or I would say brotherly, compassionate. You would have seen those sprays. I think normally we see uh, in, uh, in, the, in the case of cattle, when they are together, you do those kind of sprays. Those sprays were used for our own population. I mean, it reminds you such imageries shouldn't go out of our cognition, our cognitive frame. And when I say our, I include everyone party in power, parties in opposition, and civil society. I think this is where I'll, I'll close first round of my, and I would, when I heard your question, we haven't done enough. One thing which I do of late, I an analyze parliamentary questions, that what is the nature of questions? And I would tell you, out of 100, not even one is on migration and migrant crisis. Look at the private member bill. Even I, that's my failure also because I was planning, it's based on lottery system. My lottery never came. So this, this is where if parliamentary questions are any indicator of the seriousness of the government and the members, I think there also we have actually not done justice to this issue. But if all of us gather here, you have data. You actually tell us how to go about it. I think we, we should take a clue from here and make sure that what we saw in 2020-21 are never seen uh, ever in our memory. And if at all there is a pandemic or there's any other crisis, our effort should be that we are prepared. They are our own people. They are not in no, no, one, no man's land. And they shouldn't be treated as objects. Because, we, or even for that matter, subject. Subjectification, many a time, also takes away their rights as citizens. I think there I land, Jain. Thank, thank you so much. I think uh, we'll, we'll hold the terms cognitive frame, we'll hold the terms our own people uh, in, in our minds as we move on. I'd like to pivot to Dr. Jodhkar uh, to, to, to really uh, uh, talk about, you know, one of the interesting responses or reactions to the crisis was that migration, which has always been embedded from the, from the government side in the Department of Labor and in the Ministry of Labor, uh, uh, the, the response actually came from unexpected quarters and from sectors that did not uh, were not sort of tasked with the job of thinking about migration. Uh, and the WCD, the Women and Child uh, Department in Maharashtra, has been involved in a very 
interesting initiative to track vulnerable migrants and ensure that they receive their social protection. So I'd like you to really elaborate on this, uh, to, to present an example of how the system actually responded in sort of contradiction to the we have not done enough. Thank you. Uh, given my uh, health background, I'm a medical doctor. So uh, I'm currently with Rajamata Jizau Potion and uh, Arogya Mission, uh, Department of WCD Government of Maharashtra. My principal secretary was to participate, but and because of uh, some emergency, she, she asked me to uh, represent her. Having said that, and as Honorable uh, MP Sir has already mentioned, that we have not done enough. So that is true. Even Varun has mentioned about the, I mean, mainstreaming the uh, various departments to see, ease out the discomfort of the migrants and their agony. So the trigger of the whole affair was that we were knowing that migrants, as far as health is concerned, I was knowing that we are concerned about the continuity of care. So the from source to uh, I mean destination, the uh, sportability of services should be ensured. That was our limited uh, I mean objective. Having said that, uh, I mean we used to have piecemeal approach in health. I am talking pre-COVID era in particular. So there were, there were tremendous dropout rates as far as immunization concerned. There were people who were deprived of services at the destination. And then uh, we, our district administration has documented that uh, the, I'm referring to circular internal migration only. When the, I mean, the migrants leave the source, the magnitude of undernutrition was X. And when they return after four months or six months uh, season, the mig it multiplies twice, thrice. And they have uh, graphed it over a period of decade or so. So the evidence was there, but as uh, Honorable MP sir has mentioned, COVID pandemic has made a visibility to the whole affair. And then, uh, then CM visited one of the tribal districts and he came to know that the more suffering is towards the women and the children. And what uh, Indian Express has a series of, uh, I mean, uh, 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 webinars and all those things. And there was one word I could catch here from them, feminization of vulnerability. And that's why the Women and Child Development Department was interested to do something to ease out the discomfort of these women and children in particular. And this is how we were interested to uh, do that. And we had uh, evidence of that, which multiplied much more in, during the COVID era. We prepared an application a uh, web uh, application and we piloted in five districts and one block of Gadshiruli. So uh, we uh, could monitor how many it was, I, mean, I confess, it's not a full solution, sir. But we made an attempt to, with the intention that our woman, our lactating woman, uh, our uh, uh, pregnant woman, as well as children up to 18 years, sir, they are, uh, I mean, at the source, they are registered as a potential migrants by the Anganwadi Seviya, and they are tracked whether they, when they are going, actual migration is also captured. And after capturing that, the services at the destination are enabled, and the disenabled at the source. And the, at, the, uh, at the destination, the services are, I mean, made available. So we, are, we try to monitor the portability of services to the actual destination. In instance, six to 18 years children who are likely to stay back, as Varun has mentioned that also, so if the parents are not, and then they, they are living with their grandparents, which are possibly not capable of, um, I mean, pushing them for study or their routines, they are a bit depressed because of uh, no parents around. Then the uh, model of Janna, which was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, piloted in 2016, we had learning out of that also. There were, a, I mean, so Anganwadi cannot do everything. And the, uh, six to 18 years uh, children was the man not mandate of ICDS either. So there were model of Balmitras, and who could ensure that how to entertain them, how, what are the problems of this staying back children, that also, uh, I mean, reach analyzed and try to see that a comprehensive solution tried to make. 
again i say we have not a full proof solution but we have and uh, and uh, i am sure that the all intentions may not translate into to 100% success but an attempt in this uh, direction was really eye opener and then we have some evidence uh, for a year or so last migration season and now we are thinking the build we are building on this uh, i mean uh, learnings and we are rolling out to all 36 districts in maharashtra we have i mean the brick clean uh, workers the sugar cane cutters and then agricultural laborers uh, wise data what is the proportion of uh, internal migration vis-a-vis -vis the uh, i mean internal migration means intra district inter district and inter state Uh, there were a couple of districts say uh, palgar district and nandurbar districts the the i mean the migrants are going to gujarat uh, gadchuroli sironcha block uh, goes to telangana so we made an inroads to adjoining districts of the uh, concerned states to see that but we saw it's a limiting factor and then again there is also a limiting factor that uh, i mean the potential migrant will say that they will they are going to destination d1 but actually the contractor will take them to d2 and then tracking becomes a challenge particularly d2 could be a unknown location or urban also as far as urban is concerned maharashtra has 45% population residing in urban area and icds reach is only 19% 19% so urban is a real gray area for from the perspective of icds so bit uh, uh, these were limitations of the whole implementations but still we are moving ahead to see that we can do some uh, thing for this uh, i mean vulnerability i will stop at this point of time uh, to take over to my colleagues thank you so much uh, lots of things came out of that first of all it's a very rich initiative and a lot of data is coming out of it which we can all learn from uh, second is this question of the interstate migrate migrant as a very uh, rich potential area of interventions within state governments which has gone under the radar the third is the real challenges with working across states uh which uh, you know migration is a lived reality but the the system doesn't really have a response to it so all of that really comes out well uh but i'll i'll pivot to to rajiv uh, who has a lot of experience in this area and uh, you know what dr jyotkar pointed out is the response to mobility in a set of so called universal schemes and responses of of the government but the migrants primary relationship with the destination as you keep telling us all the time is work uh, so you know what's happening there do you really see an improvement in their ability to assert themselves as workers as urban citizens uh, what is ajivika learned uh, during covid no i think that's a very relevant question mukta because uh, i think that's the frontier which is not changing it's actually business as usual you know and that, which is that which is what needs urgent attention and i bring experience of uh, a very large migration corridor i live in rajasthan in south rajasthan and we are one of the largest uh, senders of workforce to gujarat and maharashtra to the very large construction markets factories manufacturing sector agriculture sector security services everything you know the works hotels and restaurants and everything millions of people go and uh, what came into attention was during the crisis was you know their situation at that point in time however some fundamentals of their of their relationship with the market with employers do not stand changed do not stand modified in fact work remains as informal as it used to be as non standardized as, as it was highly fragmented being conducted in highly precarious and hazardous kind of conditions with no assurance of minimum wages of basic occupational safety standards of access to social protection and what drove people out was lack of housing and so there is no housing yet right and i think those were the kind of very structural kind of issues that migrant workers have known experienced faced for decades before covid and they have gone back to those same kind of conditions right and i think that's where intervention is most urgently needed in which is in the in solving the informality in the precarity and the lack of and the massive exclusion that workers of all kind not just migrants of all informal spectrum especially in the case of migrants their vulnerability becomes more acute right 
Now, what has happened is that a lot of attention has got converted to data enumeration, counting people, doing eShram kind of you know large scale uh, enumeration and registration exercises, and it is shifted to skilling. Okay, so let's do skill mapping. Now, in my understanding, that both of these are meaningless unless some of the fundamental issues are sorted of wages, of work conditions, you know, what happens with mass registration if we don't know what this is going to convert to in terms of benefits and, you know, protection and so on. Uh, portability, which, uh, which, this is a really good example. I'm happy to hear this. You know, and I think that's a very key thing for, for migrants that they should become entitled to benefits and schemes regardless of their domicile. Whether you're from Bihar or from Odisha, if you're in Gujarat, then you should be part of the core social protection framework of Gujarat. You cannot imagine the kind of exclusions that exist, continue to exist, that will keep non-Gujarati workers outside Gujarat social protection. Now that kind of very exclusionary mindset has not changed. Okay? What has changed is some amount of public consciousness, a certain middle class morality, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, migrant workers, you know, as, as human beings, it's, it's good, but not, not, not at all sufficient, not at all transformatory. So I argue that we have to bring attention back to migrants as workers and examine again the relationship of work with capital. And unless that is intervened in, unless we bring fundamental changes in that, we will not solve the migrant issue, right? Now that requires, of course, the participation of industry, that needs employers to come into that discussion, and, regula and, and of course, law to be on the side of, the, of workers. Just to close, last thing being, in all of this, there is a very strong potential role for unions and for workers' organizations. Unfortunately, you know, that's where I think our bargaining power has become really weak. And that unionization being as weak as it is, especially for, port, for highly mobile migrants, you know, the chance for argument of or making claims in a system which is adverse, you know, to start with, it's not going to be easy if unions remain so weak. Yeah, I'll add to that. I mean, yesterday evening we closed the day with a panel on Delhi, uh, which really highlighted how hostile cities are. Dr. Jyotkar's brought up the urban pr problem. The social protection panel yesterday brought up brought it up as well. So when you combine this lack of bargaining power and locate it spatially in an urban location where governance capacities are particularly strained, uh, we're, we're looking at a problem that's quite complex and we really don't have any beginnings of answers. I know that uh, Ajibika is doing some experimentation around this and I'll come back to you on that. Uh, Amrita, let me pivot to the opposite end because I think in India we've always seen this migration issue from the rural end of things. We've always looked at rural development and the rural livelihoods as sort of an answer and a lens to look at the migration issue. We call it the sedentary bias in, in, in sort of research terms, but it privileges this narrative of distress. Uh, and I know that your work has been in Bihar and you've looked at it for a long time. Uh, how do you, have, has that shifted? I mean, initial reactions in source governments feel, I mean, there seems to be some change in, in the mindset, but is that going to follow through into policy or are we going to harden back into this very rural versus urban kind of thinking? No, so I think, you know, the whole idea of migration is that we're talking about over here is essentially rural urban migration, though we have many other streams, but you know, what amplified during COVID was the rural urban stream. Now, the fundamental issue is that, you know, there is rural distress of a kind which we have not seen in the past, right? Like just today we have this, uh, we heard the news that we had better than normal monsoons, right? More than 6%, um, so rains were 106% more than what it should be. But what was also hidden in that news is that, you know, in July and August, you had very localized kinds of droughts that were there in Jharkhand, in UP, in Bihar, and therefore the sowing of the Sakhari crop was affected. So we know then about 5% of sown area has declined for Kharif and as well as uh, oil seeds and pulses. And when I say Kharif, I mean, you know, the Kharif paddy. Now this is really alarming. So we really have that, you know, agricultural distress, which is very much prominent. But the other thing linked with migration is that, you know, agricultural distress uh, is also very linked with a whole decoupling of agriculture from the rural. And when I say that, you know, like uh, I've been working at the Institute for Human Development in a um, 
survey-based uh, research for the last uh, more than 10 years. And we find like in a state like Bihar, you have in 1999, 50% of household income came from agriculture. This declined to 25% in uh, 2011. And by 2016, it was 20%. So the contribution of agriculture to household income in rural Bihar is as low as 20%. That's very low. It's a 90% rural state. So then the distress is not only agrarian, but also a rural distress. So, you know, we've had, uh, we've not been able to transition from an agricultural to a rural economy, and that is the context of migration. It is the context of rural distress. But, you know, rural distress isn't the only uh, context of migration. Workers also respond to a very strong labor demand in urban areas. And we see this post liberalization We see that, you know, um, Demand for casual labor across urban India and urban agglomerations has increased. And what does this really mean? So this really this means that the worker is in the context of rural distress going to the urban and working. But if you ask any of these migrant workers, um, there is a clear sense that, you know, this is they say, you know, in North India, ye majburi ke le jate hai. So it's it's out of economic compulsion that they're going. And that is also the context, right? So that this course is very much there. They all went back and they came back to the destinations, right? Many of them, you know, despite um, a lot of indignities, because that is where, like Rajiv said, the work is there. They, and, you know, so that context, I think, is very important uh, in terms of understanding the rural. So when we then, uh, you know, um, so we understand the agrarian distress, the rural distress, and that hasn't really changed very much. And uh, we also know very well that workers like to stay in the rural. They don't come out by choice. By and large, for a majority of workers, we see this very well. If they have the option of staying back in the rural, they don't want to work in agriculture. So working outside of agriculture and working in a context where um, you have a decent job, jobs that provide uh, employment for long periods of time. It, that's the problem. In rural areas, much of the work is where it fluctuates, right? They would like very much, they're okay to earn a lower wage and be there. But what you also hear is that, uh, and we, our data very clearly shows that even in the context of high migration in Bihar, where you have, um, um, you know, where there's an option for non-agricultural work, where workers can commute, they prefer to stay back. And my rates of migration are actually lower in villages where there is option of commuting. So I think commuting is a real substitute availability of local non-agricultural work is a real substitute to migration. So I think the discourse has not very much changed, but we really need to kind of see how we can focus on the rural, because that is the fundamental of where the migration is coming from. I'll stop there. Thank you, Amrita. You've actually given me a great segue into some of the work that we do at CPR on small towns and census towns and trying to understand the economic transformations in exactly the kind of places where you're talking, which are in within commuting distance from rural locations, but not necessarily requiring hundreds and thousands of kilometers of travel away. And that's another, I'll park it out there to say that that's an agen agenda for research that we're interested in and we think should be part of the migration discourse and of the rural development and of the urban development discourse. But um, Dr. Jyotkar, you've, you know, this, this experiment or the scaling up that of, the, of the migration tracking system in Maharashtra, and I'm asking you to go out on a limb uh, here. I know that it's early days, and I know that you're still learning a lot. Um, but how does an experiment like this in a specific state actually feed into national missions, so feed upwards, feed laterally into does, for example, the Labor Department in Maharashtra have any uh, understanding, I mean, how involved are they in what you're doing and how do they actually feed in or how do you feed into what they are doing? Yeah, uh, very good question. So that's why I made a passing uh, remark of mainstreaming what Varun mentioned in the initial remarks. So we try to, uh, I mean, uh, put them in the loop, labor department, education department, health department. But having said that, uh, their department priorities also were there. And, the, and we were not looking for any resources, but only if the manpower and the, if they are aware of that, that will be a page. Uh, Honorable High Court has pushed uh, uh, one, uh, P, uh, for a PIL for the malnutrition. And then 
wherein the public health department is the main, I mean, uh, respondent in that case. And then they uh, try to seek some information also. So they are, I, we, we thought that health department at least should be with us as far as nutrition and health are inseparable entities. But uh, having said that, we try to do it as a solo. But uh, uh, we have kept them informed and we are sharing our data with them. Uh, even chief secretary takes a review of that and whatever the vulnerability, what are the, I mean, the list also we make it share through chief secretary. So chief secretary is the platform wherein we make it so that uh, there could be principal secretary talking to additional chief secretary may not be a good idea, but chief secretary can handle it uh, in a hierarchy. Uh, as far as the uh, vertical intervention is concerned, so what I said, our, um, I mean, app starts as a supply-driven uh, entity. We start from the source uh, and then potential migrants and then track it to the uh, destination. Uh, people take it that you are burning your uh, frontline uh, worker, so uh, they have to track and then see whether they, I mean, uh, that is true. I mean, but and particularly, as I said in the process, that six to eighteen years is uh, not the mandate of ICDs, and that uh, particularly, uh, that except Janna and Palgar, the I mean, the response was a lukewarm. So that was m our understanding. But now we have identified the uh, uh, rolling out of that is Balmitra and uh, uh, youth volunteers, which Janna experimented over there. We are rolling out to the, uh, other districts, so to and building a module of uh, so ICPS also. Uh, along with ICDS. So, WCD is mandate as well as not only nutrition only, but the protection also. So, uh, that will encompass and that will give a more, uh, I mean, uh, stability. That is what we intend to do. As far as vertical expansion is concerned, uh, the ICDS currently has a app called as Potion uh, Tracker uh, under the Potion Abhiyan. Earlier it was common application software, but they have now shifted to Potion Tracker. Uh, there they are uh, thinking of having a, uh, I mean, uh, demand driven, means only destination they will uh, target. But one who is, uh, destinations who do not approach because, you know, the sugarcane cutters are in the farms. They are neither in this village nor in that village. And they are, I mean, the contractor and the conditions are such that they, if they go to Anganwadi, their wage losses uh, could be an, uh, uh, I mean, uh, an entity. So, rather than leaving it to the demand to approach the Anganwadi or the services, why not track from the, I mean, uh, we are leaving it to the, uh, I mean, demand and that will be the, again, the deprivation will be uh, ad not addressed. That is our view is. So we are approaching uh, NEGD as well as we had uh, one of our district collector has flagged this before Niti Aayog also in one of the ADP district uh, because uh, district collector Bastar has made an attempt to highlight the problem uh, migration create in, in uh, I mean, sustaining and enhancing the, uh, I mean, uh, malnutrition, childhood malnutrition, I believe. Particularly COVID-19, the Lancet paper says that the 16% increase in childhood malnutrition my, uh, my is, uh, is uh, possible in the globally. And the, uh, I mean, vulnerable districts will be, it will be much more than that. So we cannot uh, lose all these evidences and predictions, and that's why uh, we wish that the NEGD uh, if, and MWCD accepts our module and keeps it uh, in their portion tracker as a one module. That will take care, a spillover benefit of that will be, it will be a nationwide pan-India, and then interstate migration will be tackled very well. So that is our wishful thinking. How it takes away, we are waiting for that. That's our uh, way of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think it's also important to note that when you're doing these very, very on-ground pilots, there are all these new imaginations that come up and, I mean, we're happy to offer a forum and how do we take that forward is then something that we can talk about subsequently. Uh, Rajiv, coming to you, and, and I'm quite fascinated because Ajivika's work is, is sort of, uh, works with multiple actors. So you're putting your worker at the center and then you're talking to employers and you're talking to, you know, many different actors in the urban uh, areas, Ahmedabad and Surat, where you work. So can you give us a sense of how these different actors contribute or can potentially contribute to improving migrants' lives? Maybe some of the recent work that you've been doing in housing uh, or any other sector. Right. So of course, you know, we do a lot of work which is directly with the, worker, with the migrant worker groups and their unions and their solidarity collectives and so on. 
Uh, but you know, externally, outside of that work, and we work with construction workers, man web workers in the low-end manufacturing sector, agriculture workers, uh, domestic workers, and so on. So there's a large spectrum, especially in Gujarat and in Maharashtra. And that work, which as far as it is related to workers' own initiative and their own, you know, the things that they do, that, that goes well. However, for many, many years, we have considered labor department to be a primary kind of stakeholder, okay? That we will work, this is the department to work with. And this is, the, this is where, this should be at the site of our policy change, or of our policy work. We should be influencing the work they do vis-a-vis -vis informal workers and migrant workers. I'm, I'm sorry to say that that department actually has become very, very disempowered, everywhere. I think it's a story everywhere except in Kerala, where it is, for reasons that we all know. But in most other states, including my own state, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, it's one of the weakest departments. It basically thrives on BOCW, which is this large building and other construction workers cess that it collects. And then it, everything is around that. It's thousands in crores of rupees. But as far as regulatory functions are concerned, as far as monitoring of wages, of work conditions, of wage thefts, of frauds, bondage, all of these have gone slowly out of their purview. And that's where we are now feeling to make a, consider them as a stakeholder. And I actually call for serious empowerment of this, of this department. It needs more resources, more people, and it needs more regulatory kind of function to be able to play a meaningful role with vis-a-vis -vis migrant workers, right? I think the, the but where, where does hope now lie, right? And I keep telling you this, Mukta, that we actually get more success with urban authorities, with urban governance. Okay, which is, you know, unexpected, because why would they care for uh, Rajasthani workers sleeping uh, under a flyover in Surat? You know, why, what is their relationship with them? But they're noticing. And I think that is changing, and we have had some good success as in provisioning of basic services like water, toilets for women, uh, getting nutrition for uh, you know, young children who are on construction sites, regardless of their domicile. So we are getting more success from urban authorities. We are getting also, uh, you know, some initial success, and I'm actually quite happy about this, in our recent work with industry. So we started, during this COVID time, we started to talk about, uh, to talk to a lot of leading industrial in big business houses who came to us to say, you know, okay, we've done our food distribution, we've sent people home, we brought them back. However, what, this should not happen again. And the argument that we were making is that change the labor standards that you abide by, not just for your own workers, but in the downstream, in your supply chain. So some of the largest industrial houses, actually they have perfect, absolutely top grade labor standards for the people that they employ, okay? However, the people they employ is only 20% of the total workforce that depends on them because everything else is contractual, is informal, it is given out to, you know, in the supply chain. Now, if the same standards of wages, of safety, of uh, gender parity, of, of, of social protection were to be cascaded down, it would affect millions and millions of workers who are very informal and largely migrant, right? And that is, so we call this initiative social compact, and we actually have pretty good sign-ups with a set of serious-minded industries who say, okay, this is, should not be just for us, our own on-roll staff, which anyway is thinning out, but for our supply chain. The kind of standards that environment, environmental standards have, you know, risen to that point, right? But labor standards also need to rise to that point. I think so industry becomes another policy, another space for policy change. So I count for two, urban governance and industry as partner. Despite this, is despite that we have a lot of confrontation with industry in our work, but partner we must. It is important because they actually influence millions of workers who are, uh, who, you know, for who they create employment. That's great. It's very counterintuitive, but but very heartening to hear. Uh, Amrita, uh, let's take the longer view for a minute to focus specifically on interstate migrants. I mean, we, we know UP and Bihar send a lot of migrants. We know that Southern and Western India receive a lot of migrants. Uh, but and, and we always moan about the positive of data. These are all, you know, uh, all our pain points as migration researchers. But we also know that spatial trends in migration are fairly set in. It's not 
fluctuating on a year-on-year -year or season-on-season -season basis, there's sort of some stability to the trends. If you could just speak to that a little bit, because I think if we are looking at multiple states getting into uh, you know, the, the, the business of responding to the idea of, you know, we have to uh, deal with the vulnerability of migration, we, we need to have a sense of where it's going to go. I think, you know, this, the socio-spatial dimension that you're talking about largely, in India, we have migration from the poor regions to the prosperous regions, right? And you can see that very well in the latest figures of the data, which are of 2011, the latest, but, you know, very clearly from UP, Jharkhand, Bihar, West Bengal, Orissa, to Gujarat, Maharashtra, Delhi, NCR. And the last census showed all the four southern states have seen, you know, I mean, the, uh, we didn't have these kinds of migration earlier. These are new migrations, right? So clearly then, you know, we have a very, the migration streams are historical, and they speak to a sense of deprivation, you know, deprivation that has sort of, you know, been there in the source regions historically for a very long period of time. And there are structural issues that really, you know, explain these kinds of migration. So I think, and, and once we get that, then we realize that it's not only the business of the sending states to do something about that, then it becomes a larger national project, right? So if you are concerned about addressing structural issues in Bihar, you need to have rural manufacturing in Bihar. You need to have rural industrialization, right? And uh, so, you know, we have Make in India right now. How can that speak to rural industrialization in Bihar? So you must then have specific incentives, socio-spatial incentives of having, uh, you know, industry in very backward regions, right? Because this is where the labors really come from. I mean, it's so ironic, you know, once I was uh, interviewing a garment worker in Delhi, and I was told that, you know, so the person stitches garments for clothes which are, which are exported to Dubai, and they're very well aware that this is happening, and they're like, why must I come to Delhi to do this? Why can't I just do this in my village in Bihar, right? So I think that if we are talking about addressing historical structural deprivations, we need to have very strong policies, right? It's not going to happen automatically. So we need very strong policies to kind of address that. And you know, ironically, we also find that uh, you're talking about all the destination, uh, how the response has been after COVID. We find that uh, we never spoke about destination responses in India, right? It's the first time we're actually talking about destination responses. And in the past, it was social networks that, you know, you have a network and that you migrate and that's the destination. Now we're actually hearing conversation about, you know, that state treats migrants better. Therefore, the migrant may choose to go there. I mean, so, but, you know, I mean, and I want to hear emphasize, you know, we keep talking about the Kerala example and somehow Kerala just feels so far from Delhi. But um, so uh, Nitya Rao and Pradhan did a study on rural migrants who returned to Bihar. Uh, and they found that they returned from various states, Gujarat, UP, Maharashtra, and Kerala. So they found that, and they, then they sort of mapped out the state responses. And so while in Gujarat, they had to struggle with NGOs, because the state didn't allow NGOs to give um, benefits. And the state didn't give benefits, didn't allow NGOs to give benefits, and so on. So there's one migrant worker who came back from Kerala, right? We keep talking about this is what policy should do. Very simply, you know, he said this is how he came back to Bihar. The collector's office helped the workers identify procedures for returning home, enabling them to first get tested for COVID. With negative results, these officials then helped the group register for the Jharkhand government special train. The transit was smooth and the behavior of the Kerala officials was very humble one of the workers said, and the train was equipped for the long journey with food and medical facilities. You know, it's really that simple when you hear about it, right? So, you know, that, and uh, so, and uh, when you speak of space and power, it's also about destination sp states and how they exercise that power. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's a great, uh, I think, start for talking about what destination states can do, should do, have the humanity and the resources and the capabilities to do. Um, I'm going to give the last sort of more curated part of the panel uh, back to Professor Jha and be a little more provocative in my questioning this time. Uh, you know, all of this is very well. We've seen there's, there's lots of emergent responses. Our hearts are in the right place. Uh, we have some beginnings of you know things that are happening and or, or, or starting to happen. But we're also seeing a slew of nativist responses of employment protections and so on and so forth. Within 
a very clear constitutional mandate where freedom of mobility is guaranteed to everyone in India. So, I mean, as a pal parliamentarian, how do you think we're going to deal with this tension? I mean, recently also the Supreme Court again re, re sort of reinforced this issue that you cannot be the citizen of a state. You're a citizen of the country. And here we are constantly battling this issue of domicile and, and state-based identification in the delivery of services. So it's very, very fundamental. Are you a citizen of Bihar or are you a citizen of India? And how is this going to play out <laughs> in, in the future? Can we, can we ever really address this issue or is the political tension just too real and too much? Thank you. Uh, before I respond, just quickly, I was listening to my uh, colleagues. Uh, we also must uh, place the entire issue of migrants, migrant crisis, uh, how their bodies are become persona for criminality of migrants facing hostility within the larger new liberal framework also. We generally don't look at the new liberal side of economics or politics for that matter. I think that should also be, unko bhi bakse mein khada karna kabhi kabhi chahiye, dunia ke kai mulko mein ye shuru ho gaya hai. Secondly, you must realize, I come from a state where jaha migrants jab aap kehte hai, to jaise maine kuch research ek javane mein ki thi ki Calcutta ko lekar ke puri Bihar ko, Bihar, Calcutta ko south ki tarah dekhta tha. Ki matlab Calcutta ne unke husband ko le liya, bhai ko le liya, to le le na wo maana jata tha ki Calcutta has eaten them up. So, wo jo Calcutta ke liye feeling thi, ab Mumbai ke liye hai, Delhi ke liye hai, Punjab ke liye hai, thankfully abhi tak Tamil Nadu ke liye nahi hai. Look at the fact, the kind of interesting names of the trains we have, Shram Sakti Express, Shram Jivi Express, Jan Sadharan Express, Jan Seva Express. So we accept migration as a natural phenomenon. Bihar mein to aap station chale jaiye, to aapko ye sawal puchne ki zarurat nahi hai. The second, among the more important part of your question, I find it very disturbing. I have no solution. It is state after state. At one point we say cooperative federalism. And our actions are against the very federal ideas or federal principles. Uh, the day is not very far because in parliament you hear a lot many things. Southern states are actually very, very disturbed, particularly with this finance commission approach. I mean, they, they are very disturbed. Now, you, they say that why should we carry the burden? Now, this nativist, nativist impulse, domicile, we are also facing that. Recently, we had made our, our government made some advertisement. People in the Twitter timeline wrote, you had promised 75% shall be reserved for Biharis. Why aren't you doing that? Now, this is across India. And this solution cannot be found in a seminar, in a discussion. Because what we find very clearly that there is a sub-sub-nationalism going on. It has buyers. When you sell nationalism for no rhyme and reason, sub-nationalism will also find its buyers. When you uh, uh, make patriotism as an everyday commodity, then there shall be another version of patriotism in Kerala, and for that matter in Bihar. Now, this is something which cannot be done by sloganeering. You can't deal with it. One India, one tax, one nation, one election, one looks good. Sounds very good. But this oneness has to be the acceptance of the diversity. Ex acceptance of the fact that certain states have perpetually remained backward. As somebody from Bihar, I'm not speaking with that impulse. But I suddenly, I, I certainly feel very bad. When I see Bihar is perceived to be a labor supplying state. I mean, they want Bihar to be happy. Aap labor base there ho. Can you imagine I found in Bihari laborers in Japan and not in good condition? Usko yaha bataya gaya ki tumko chara jar milta hai, hum tumko pachi se jar denge. Ab wo yen or rupee ka to janta nahi hai value. Wo chala gaya, uska passport rakliya apne. I met a couple of them. 
we are trying to work on that but this is an all india phenomena this impulse is going to destroy whatever we have achieved and it should certainly not be the major thing in 75th year of india's independence it's worrisome i have no solution मैं अक्सर ये कहा करता हूँ कि कुछ हमारे देश में कुछ दिक्कतें ऐसी हैं जिसका सोल्यूशन डोलो 65 या क्रोसिन की तरह नहीं है वी हैव टू कलेक्टिवली थिंक थिंक आउट ऑफ बॉक्स कम आउट ऑफ दिस नेटिविस्ट फ्रेम एंड इफ वी से कोऑपरेटिव फेडरलिज्म आर एक्शन शुड स्पीक मोर देन द वर्ड्स एंड फाइनली सो टू यू यू सेड लेबर मिनिस्ट्री एंड इन योर प्रीवियस Uh, observation you had spoken about the bargaining power going low they are, they have a correlation trade unions workers organizations they have become museumized ab aapko milna hoga to unse ja ke sangrahalay mein dhoondenge ki ek zamane mein is desh mein trade union bhi hua karta tha so i mean all this leads to a kind of collective failure and that is why that is why we look at migrants at from a distance i'm not saying we you certainly look it from within but most of the policy makers look at migrants migrant workers this phenomena from a distance as if they are from another planet unless you make them co traveler with you nothing will improve thank you thank you so much on that note i think it's a good time to open the panel up uh, for questions from the audience and uh, let's take one round and then all panelists can respond so the first one here and another one there if you do you, do you need a second mic um, hi uh, i'm um, with another just take yeah just take this you are audible yeah uh, good afternoon sir uh, thank you panel Working uh, in the space of migration, I've got an opportunity to work with Jessica Hunt for a year, and it's been very enriching. Coming to the, coming to the first question, if you stop working, if you just change your place. I hope I was audible till the first part. Yeah. So, given uh, the topic uh, today was evolving policy framework, and uh, in Varun's uh, PPTI, saw the mention of one nation, one ration card. While we have acknowledged and uh, addressed the larger aspect that we have been facing, especially in context of inter uh, internal migration on poor workers, portability as the new area that has been evolving as a framework, in addition to the new policies that the Niti Aayog is also bringing, in addition to the state. so do you think the portability especially with respect to onrc now all the third post state has enabled it do you see that as a so potential solution because it comes with its challenges but as a potential solution for other social protection schemes that is my first question and second question is thank you uh, ms datta for mentioning the point from kerala i think kerala has been a pioneering state when it comes to making uh, revolutionary you know uh, efforts for as a destination state beat from language beat from apnagar model other state like that is one of the conversation that came up for the panelists is can such similar models kerala chatisgarh jharkhand maharashtra can that be taken up at the you know central level and because not all state can replicate each other's model because it might not work out we have to understand the states are different but what can best be taken and i think uh, mr khanderwal's experience from that comes also in play so those are the question thank you thank you so one on onorc and its applicability and second on up scale Uh, hi uh, my name is gauri and i'm a student of miranda house um so my question is to mr khandewal when we were talking about informality you spoke about the need to focus on migrants by keeping their identity as workers in centrality so then my question is then where within this ambit where does the idea of female migration post marriage lies right which is also one of the major reasons women in india migrate from their house of residence to their husband's house which could be in a different state or a city right so where exactly does that idea lie within this conceptualization and also be if in the current epistemology there is a space to account for that kind of migration then is it far fetched to argue that um the domestic labor that the women contribute in their households can be regarded as actual tangible work and is it far fetched to see them as laborers who have migrated from one region to another even if it is out of marriage thank you great question namaste sir मेरा क्वेश्चन मनोज सर से है सर बिहार स्टेट ने एंसेंट में इंडिया को रूलर दिए 
साम्राज्य बड़े बड़े राजा और पूरे इंडिया को शिक्षा भी दी लगभग दुनिया को शिक्षा दी नालंदा के माध्यम से आखिर ऐसा क्या हुआ कि मतलब जो एक तरीके से एक समय जो दुनिया को या भारत को रास्ता दिखाता था जो राज्य उसकी इतनी मतलब निगेटिव स्थिति हो गई मैं इसलिए भी कह रहा हूँ क्योंकि आई एम बिलो बिलोंग टू वेस्ट यूपी और बिहार से कुछ माइग्रेंट्स वर्कर आते हैं और उनकी जो स्थिति है मैं अपने शब्दों में बयान नहीं कर सकता मैंने अपनी आँखों से देखा है बहुत बुरी है कुछ की शायद अच्छी होगी बट बहुत बुरी है तो पूछना मैं यही चाहता हूँ कि आखिर एक राज्य जो कभी राजा महाराजा दिया करता था जो इंडिया को रूल किया करता था जो इंडिया की कैपिटल था और उसके बाद एजुकेशन में भी जो टॉप था आखिर क्या हुआ आखिर कैसे ये स्थिति आई थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर दिस ग्रेट पैनल आई वाज वंडरिंग टू व्हाट एक्सटेंट एंड दिस इज फ्रॉम द लास्ट सेट ऑफ कमेंट्स दैट यू मेड प्रोफेसर जहा दैट हाउ मच ऑफ वॉट वी आर फेसिंग इज इनहेरेंट विद इन द मॉडल ऑफ डिवेलपमेंट एंड uh sort of the urban bias within that in 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 the sense that you're talking of migrant workers from bihar we see the same way exploitation of natural resources in jharkhand so there are certain so you know earlier it was the you know the the british uh, when we had the british empire then it was that you know this is a colony for the british empire now within india we have call, like you know there are colonies that are supplying to other parts of the country whether it's labor or its resources so how much of it is inherent within our very conception of development as a utilitarian model wherein it's it's the greatest good of the greatest number and uh, it is when you know michael lipton's book on uh, the urban bias within development theory uh, that this is inevitable if this is the model of development that we want to uh, follow which we have been following for the last 75 years okay um, so you know there cannot be any argument with portability you know this is the right thing to do however if pds was the right thing to begin with i have went out you know because that is not going to be operationalized anytime soon you know one nation one nation one card one ration card this will not be a reality anytime soon i think it we should really examine the exclusions that state governments place before core social security okay which means things like healthcare through pension through child care nutrition you know uh, these the basics as essential services should not be uh, gated because of domicile okay and i think at least we go do away with that don't think about portability but think about access wherever people are so rather than to say my entitlement will be portable from bihar to gujarat forget that at least make the gujarat entitlement available and even that would be a big step forward especially in healthcare housing sanitation and so on right so that I, you know, I think that it's a it's a broadly a good idea. The National Commission (NCUS), which was set up in 2006-2007, had made extensive recommendations around this, around setting up universal social security boards, which actually has not happened. And if you create that, then you create a seamless kind of architecture of social protection for workers, regardless of where they come from. You know, and you're very right as far as to to just sign off this entire large workforce and save workforce. as married migration is a huge disservice to the contribution of female labor in the economy and as well as in their right place in the labor migration narrative so at least the kind of workers that we are talking about the the accompanying female is always a worker okay and it she's a worker on two counts she is also reproducing all of household care functions in very very frugal conditions in the cities okay especially look at where women where a lot of migrant workers who live in the open and what women do there in one of our studies we found that their work day in such spaces is about their total day is about 16 hours if that they're working because so much of that time is about collecting basic material to do cooking and to washing and to do all that you know so out of marital love and all that they have to first do that and then go to work because of the jodi system in many places especially in construction the man gets paid not the not the woman you know because they get paid in a couple and all of that work gets kind of you know completely unaccounted and i think there's a major i think call for uh, reassessing female work participation in the migration streams right it is hugely underaccounted so i quite agree with you with what you're saying just and a quick thing the urban bias is very clear it's actually even 
you know, it's a Marxist kind of uh, analysis that how how large amounts of rural workers have been released <coughs> to join the urban workforce at cheap rates. So if you keep rural areas poor, large numbers of workers will get out and will join urban areas for whatever is available to them. So this cannot be just an accident. I think there's a policy major, there's some ideological or economic morality issue here that what have we done to rural areas to, and in fact, what you were saying, Manuji, that how come we don't talk about development in Bihar or in Rajasthan, where I come from? We could have had similar, but we have to keep some of these areas impoverished so that cheap labor is available to fuel the prosperity of our cities. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the second question. Uh, Second, uh, on portability, you have already explained the position and I join. Bihar ka aisa kyun hal hai, humare saath hi western UP ke, inho ne poochha tha. Upar wale se, jab upar jaunga to ye zarur poochhunga, ke Bihar ka aisa hal kyun bana ke rakha apne. But historically speaking, on a serious note, if you examine Bihar's contribution to national GDP, uh, before 1925, I'm uh, close to 1925 uh, to 35. Just the separation took place from uh, Odisha, and uh, and even till 60s, you would find a different story altogether. Now, many people do not uh, realize that large number of investment which came came in the Jharkhand part of Bihar. Now, when Jharkhand was a separate made a separate state, uh, I I say that Bihar was left with with only dhul dhup varsha uh, dhul uh, dhup of uh, varsha we have we had nothing but there is strong potential and there i'll draw rajiv ji and i'll go back to her question you know uh, in my university i when i'm uh, I take i take a class on social policy and development and i was a great admirer of paul baron wallerstein andre gunder frank you know most of the states prefer having the model of metropolis and satellite. I mean, it is not only at international level, it is at national level, it is at regional level, it is at sub-regional level, because capital has metamorphed itself. The global capital has probably understood uh, that changing times better than the arguments for socialist movement or communist movement, they have understood better. So what they have understood, that look, depoliticize labor, number one, which, where we talked about uh, labor rights or their rights as citizens. Second, continuous cheap labor supply. And there, there, thereby, you need, even in Bihar, areas like Simanchal, particularly Purnia, Saharsa, Madhubani, you would find a map which, which can be called a migrant map of uh, Bihar. Not all districts of Bihar, they have this uh, crisis of migration. There are certain uh, districts. So there must be some reason. And it is not by chance. I can vouch for the fact it is by design. Look at the fact that growth rate, GDP, which is very tough. Even today morning, uh, Honorable Vice President said, India's growth story. Now, you and me would want a growth story where migrants have face, their faces matter. I mean, in a Samantha ke Mahasagar mein, Samridhi ke paanch tapuon ki growth story, India ki growth story nahi ho sakti hai. Agar aap us growth story pe yakin karenge, to saal dar saal hum is tarah ke muddon par baat karenge without any resolution. So I, I think uh, this is, and I promise aapke sawal par ki ye dard mujhe bhi hai, lekin iska ilaj ab niche nahi hai, upar hi hoga. Thank you. A round or le lete hai, but only two questions because we've actually run out of time. So I'll take one from there. So at that end, and maybe one from here, just so that the extremes are represented, the peripheries. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, my question is for Manoj, sir. Sir, in context of India, if we talk about uh, migration, so the people from Eastern UP and Bihar, 
if comes to area like mumbai surat bangalore they have to mo- not all of them but some of them have to compromise their dignity and respect so is uh, do you think there should be a legal backing just available for scst against astro- atrocity and for women at work please uh, hello sir my name is amrit i work as a lamb fellow uh, my question to you was uh, about the nativism that you spoke is now creeping in sir if, even if uh, in the states uh, such as in mine odisha or uh, states such as bihar we manage to create jobs there is this uh, inherent tendency uh, inherent political pressure that you have to resolve those jobs for the locals or at least i mean the political side of it is so so uh, since again the political will is required uh, to not do this where do we draw the line how do we make politicians uh find a balance between nativism and actually creating jobs so that uh, needless migration can be stopped thank you um before uh, professor jha answers the questions i think maybe all the other panelists can have half a minute to just um give their concluding thoughts and i'll start with tiksha tiksha is also from the government of maharashtra uh, she's been deeply embedded in the mission so i'm sorry you didn't get a chance to say much you i know you've been supporting the mission and working very hard uh, you know at the back end so your chance to 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 tell us what your takeaways from the panel are and then we'll move down and come last to professor jha sure so at, as uh, dr jyotkar said ki uh yet maharashtra we piloted this maharashtra migration tracking system in six states and then uh, sorry six districts one block of gadchiroli district so the learnings were like it was just we we had a limitation like we just focused on rural and tribal migration we didn't consider urban migration as uh, jyotkar sir mentioned the urban complexity in the state so now we are expanding it to the 36 uh, 36 districts all over pan maharashtra and now we are planning to get uh, urban migration into picture like uh, though we have just 19% of icds coverage in urban area but now we are focusing like how our field functionaries will track that uh, urban migration and just ensure the portability of services so the main objective of this was the vulnerable like women and children especially who are who are the mandate of women and child development department and also the social protection so also when we say bal mitra like youth volunteer this is a new con- concept for you people like like these are the 18 to 23 years uh, of children uh, sorry youth in the respective village and when we interacted with the field so we got to know that they were the ones when the parents migrated so they uh, they possibly uh, they were the school drop out children so they cared about their fellow uh, children and they, they said that we'll look after them and they convinced their parents that you migrate and leave your children behind and we can provide them psycho social support and also we can c- connect you to the parents who migrated to the destination so uh, this i specifically spoke about maharashtra's migration tracking system which we work upon yeah. thank you diksha amrita yeah i just wanted to you know make a brief comment on the point about female migration and i think this is where data is really important why is it that you know we count them as marriage migrants right that because th- the option is migration for marriage or migration for work you should, all you need to do is have the option in the data collection instrument that accommodates considers migration for work as well right and then you will see very different numbers right so this whole invis- invisibilization of women in migration stream is largely because of our data and it can be corrected very easily right so that's one mm-hmm. and it's the same with women's work and i don't want to go into that debate i also want to add a little bit to this whole you know um debate about urban bias right so i mean there's absolutely no doubt you in india the migration that we see is largely circular migrants work for larger part of their lives in the city and then they eventually go back to the village um to retire or to work again or so on so you have the rural which is subsidizing the cost of labor and its reproduction right and that is re- so the rural areas in fact then subsidize the urbanization project and uh, so i think we didn't get a chance to talk about the circularity but this circularity is a fundamental feature we don't have permanent settlement of migration uh, of migrants in the city as we would imagine and this also contributes to a stunted urbanization and all the polis- all the problems that come with it so yeah broadly that should i apologize for exiting quickly but <laughs> so rajiv has that. a plane to catch so he's going so to say I'm his sorry, piece and leave I'm but no, so sorry i actually wanted to i will stay for some time i want to listen to mon manoj ji wine you know conclude this my limited point is that migration is a in my 
own it has to do with my own orientation and work it is a labor rights issue it is a it is a labor rights concern and we should primarily attend to it in the context of how workers and their rights especially informal workers are getting compromised in our economy so i i say the same thing in every platform which is useful i say it in different ways but i say we must attend to core issues of dignity of fair wages of protection of housing of sanitation of good safe transportation to make india a worker friendly not to cheapen labor anymore but to see investment in workforce as a way to improve productivity of the country as a whole this is what a lot of western economies have got it right right they don't see it as cost centers they see it as investments and i think that morality has to come back with this indian industry and our policy imagination just a quick last comment yes. uh, thank you i will mean just uh, last comment uh, somebody told about the jung sahas uh, and uh, uh, i just uh, forgot to tell that we also learned from jung sahas also we had uh, a couple of interactions with jung sahas because they have multi state uh, i mean in uh, presence and then uh, uh, sitara iit mumbai and uh, i have international institute of population sciences because they have uh, i mean also um, uh, faculties having uh, work in uh, migration so we have got a state migration committee wherein we invite them also and that is how and unicef is uh, unicef maharashtra is uh, making us the resource availability because it's very difficult to carve out budget from the uh, go government kitty sir that's why they are uh, to help us to experiment this uh, ex uh, this thing and that's why it's not only money but the uh, consensus decision and uh, taking the pros and cons and how weighed away so this is a consensus decision various brains of multidisciplinary that have helped us and uh, gave us the confidence that's it thank you over to you thank you <clears throat> uh, the first question uh, from my friend lem fellow from uh, odisha you know uh, uh, even at the uh, risk of sounding unpopular i would say that ideas like nationalism should not be seen through parochial lens once you start doing that once you make that a commodity it does not spare anyone including diaspora w what we have seen in recent times now what happens that the regional the regions several regions are under the influence of regional parties so far so if they see that at central level at union level this is being sold so they have their own version now that's something this is a problem which has to be collectively ha handled there is no solution i am hearing from odisha i am hearing from my own state my state did not have this kind these kind of voices 5 years back 6 years back that means something has what we say something is rotten in the state of denmark now having said that my all my colleagues here the other question about dignity and respect all my colleagues here have underlined one fact that we are talking about migrant workers as an entity constitutional legal and most of all moral because uh, you said middle class i have a huge difference on that middle class has a very ambivalent attitude towards migrant workforce it is not yet resolved they want migrant workforce services they want don't want their site service is okay site is not so this conflict between service and site has to be resolved now second important thing which many of us miss when a migrant boards a train from bihar he carries his caste she carries her caste and gender now caste and gender issues are too complicated from the source to the destination and it has impact in terms of all kinds of special arrangements for instance when, it, when the call was given do gaz जरूरी है क्या दो गज आ, दो गज की दूरी है जरूरी विदाउट रियलाइजिंग दैट कि चार गज में तो चार लोग रह रहे हैं नाउ नाउ दीज आर दीज आर सम ऑफ द क्वेश्चन आई थिंक बट वट डू से द लास्ट वर्ड हैज टू बी फ्रॉम यू थैंक यू वेरी मच ऑन डिग्निटी एंड रिस्पेक्ट आई रिटरेट दैट मोस्ट ऑफ दीज थिंग्स हैज टू बी कन्वर्टेड इन टू एन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल इंस्ट्रूमेंट एंड वंस वी डू दैट आई थिंक दिस शैल carry further thank you thank you so much to all my panelists
I don't have any last words except that this is a continuing conversation and we will be here year on year making sure that this issue is not disappearing from our public imagination. Thank you for attending.